The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, How Do You Come Across to Others? Hosted by HRDQU and presented by Peggy Greenberg. My name is Sarah, and I will moderate today's webinar. The webinar will last about an hour, so if you have any questions, go ahead. You can type them into your questions box in the um, control panel for GoToWebinar, and then we'll either answer those questions um, as they come in. Um, we'll answer them live at the end of the session if we have some time, um, and otherwise, we will put all unanswered questions up on our blog after the session so you can take a look at it there. Our presenter today is Peggy Greenberg, and she's going to um, dive in, give us a dynamic session today right away. So thank you so much, Peggy, for joining us. Great. Thank you, Sarah. I'm really looking forward to spending this hour with all of you discussing how we come across to others. And this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And, and so the question really is, you know, do you know how you come across to others? Um, we don't get a second chance to make a first impression. We've all heard that before. And every interaction that we have influences a person in one way or another. And in this world of, you know, instant sound bites, people jump to conclusions quickly about you. And then, unfortunately, they often don't change their minds. So getting to the bottom of how you come across to people is the key to being assertive, influential, and confident both at work and at home. And I think it's really the cornerstone to your success. It's about how you relate to people, how people receive you, and how you get along with others. And sometimes the way people perceive you might be different than the way you perceive yourself. In fact, sometimes your perceptions are radically different than what the other person believes or perceives about you. A good example of this is I teach a, a, a two-day live facilitation skills course. And ever so often during the, the two-day time period that we're together, I, I take a kind of a one-on-one -on -one with the participants to see how's it going for you, how, how are you applying the information. And I had one participant we, uh, recently who told me she was uncomfortable. And I said, well, what's going on? And she said, you intimidate me. And this really kind of opened my eyes. My, my perception was that I was a very open and caring and understanding uh, moderator, very positive, giving lots of positive feedback. But, but she said I was intimidating. And maybe that was because I was very organized and I, I have a lot of experience that, that I was sharing. And I try to get to the bottom line when people are asking a question. I try to figure out exactly what they're, they're asking. So even though I didn't mean to intimidate her, that's the way she perceived me. So believing you're one way while other people perceive you another way can, can really be detrimental to relationships. So now you have to know or you have to get to know what people think of you. And remember that most, if not all, of our actions are designed to influence people in one way or another. And if you want to do a reality check on how you influence people, try, try one of these suggestions. I think they're really great ones. And the first thing is to listen. Listen to what people say about you, particularly when they introduce you. What words do they use? Do they use words like understanding, compassionate, analytical, energetic, go-getter, the nicest person I know, passionate about her work, always gets what they want, kind, intelligent, uh, you know, great listener? Whatever the words are, listen to what people say about you when they introduce you, and that'll give you an idea of how you're perceived by other people. Another way to find out how you're perceived by other people is to ask them. Get a variety of feedback from people you trust and have relationships with. You know, your, your family, your friends, your boss, your coworkers, your colleagues, your manager. Uh, if you have a coach, ask your coach. Ask them this question. When you think of me, what adjectives come to mind? And assess your influence style. And, and there are some great tools available to, to do that. And today, we're going to be talking about one of those tools to see what style you have when you influence others. So here's where we're headed in the, in the hour that we have here. Uh, we have here together this afternoon. Um, and this is our, our roadmap for today's session. So we're going we're gonna to start off about uh, 
talking about why influence is an important skill in today's world. And then we're going to define influence style and particularly learn about the four common influence styles. And we're going to we're going to take a real deep dive into each of those four styles and recognize the indicators of each of those styles and discuss why assertive behavior is the one that yields the most positive results. And we're also going to talk about how some styles can hamper our interpersonal communication. And as Sarah said, hopefully there'll be some time at the end um, for us to, to have some questions and answers at the end of today's session. But I want to start out by, by telling you a little bit about me so you know who is this person and why is she, uh, why is she talking to us about influence. Um, first of all, a little bit about my background. I worked as the director of training for a, a variety of healthcare organizations in Boston and Baltimore and Washington, D.C. And I was also most recently the director of the Office of Education and Training for the United States Senate. I also, um, when I left the Senate, I started my own consulting, training and consulting business. So I serve as an executive coach and a consultant. I conduct, conduct training seminars for a variety of organizations and I'm also an online moderate, moderator for business management and communication topics. So I think I can safely say that my entire career has been dependent upon my ability to influence others. And I do believe it is a core competency for everyone. And I assume that since you're making time out of your what have to be very busy schedules at this time of year to participate in today's session, you do too. So I'd like to learn a little bit about you so that I can uh, potentially tailor some of my remarks uh, specifically to you as we go on. So we're going to start off with a quick poll. And what I'd like to know is what is your primary role in your organization? Are you a, a team member, a specialist, or a subject matter expert? Are you a supervisor? Uh, are you a project team or unit manager? Are you in middle management? Or are you a member of upper management or an executive team? Now, I know not all jobs are here, so just find the one that's closest to your job. So I'm going to give you a minute. If you can answer that poll, make sure you hit submit. Okay, so it looks like um, over half of you are team members, specialists, or subject experts. Great. Um, we got, and then we have some folks that are in uh, management. We have some supervisors, some middle managers, and some upper management. So that's about another 30%. And then we have some project teams and some unit, ma unit managers. Well, thank you all for that information. And again, it's really helpful um, for, for, me to, for me to know that. Um, so I have another, I have another question for you as we, uh, another poll for you. And um, the poll this time is, uh, I believe influence is, is it innate or is it learned? What do you think? Is it innate or is it learned? Make sure you hit submit once you answer that poll question. All right, so it looks like um, you all are right on the money here um, with 70% of you saying that you believe influence is learned and you are absolutely right. Influence is a skill that can be learned. If you look at influence and um, you have, you know, if you look at influence, certainly in influence there are some personality characteristics. However, um, and, and those personality characteristics might help you in the beginning, but for the most part, the skills that we have in regard to influence and the ones that we're going to be talking about are things that can be learned. So let's see uh, why you might, you might, you know, you might ask why, why bother? And uh, why is this, you know, why is this important? It's already sounding like maybe this is a little more difficult than I'm, you know, a little more energy than I'm willing to put out. And First of all, businesses and organizations have changed over the years. I certainly know, and, and I've been around the block many, many times, and I've certainly seen incredible changes in organizations over the years. And most recently, influence style has become 
uh, more important, increasingly more important, because organizations have become flatter, they've become less hierarchical and more diverse, and focus has shifted from competition to collaboration. So the skills needed to, to function effectively have shifted from skills of command and control to skills of influence. And according to re the research by Krishman and Khan, um, the view of people as communicators has also has also sh has also shifted. You know, historically, people were seen as passive responders when it comes to communication. You know, uh, they were just talked to or talked at in organizations. Now they're they're more active. Their their voices need to be heard. There needs to be more collaboration, and there has been more choice. And there certainly is much more choice in conveying a message than there than there was historically. And in this global atmosphere, negotiation and understanding are crucial skills at all levels. And good negotiation skills involve influence. You cannot negotiate with someone. You cannot uh, come out uh, you know of a negotiation that you feel was successful if you didn't use influence at, at all. And as uh, Ronald Darnett, who's an expert, uh, an esteemed expert in communication and, and dialogue um, said, he said that he said that we have to um, walk, the human must walk with his partner in dialogue on a narrow ridge between two extremes. And I ask you just to kind of picture this with me, if you will, and the sort of the, the two extremes of this narrow ridge are the extreme of refusing to attempt to understand the other's perspective of a situation, and then the other end of that narrow ridge, the other extreme, is forsaking, forsaking your own ground and and blindly following the other's opinion. So we really have to again it's a it's a very it's a very narrow ridge between those extremes and obviously it's so crucial to our relationships and it's it's so important that we we learn how to uh, navigate that because in any dialogue um, that human beings you know it's important in any dialogue that as human beings we voice our views while attempting to simultaneously understand others, other people's views, and and this is really, uh, this is really at the core of what effective influencers do in order to have an impact. They voice their views while attempting to simultaneously understand others' views. Now I say that as though it's just this simple, easy thing that you know, happens all the time and can be done without any thought or any consideration. Um, however, it, it really does require a lot of thought and a lot of consideration, and that's what we're going to be talking about here in a few minutes. So I want to ask you another question. I'm going to ask you to share this via, um, via chat. Um, and my question is, how do you see yourself using influence skills. I know that many of you are coming from the realm of being a team member and then a sizable percentage of you, a third of you or so, are coming from management ranks. So how do you see yourself using influence, influencing skills? Go ahead and type that in for me. And I'll see what everybody hopefully has an answer to that. You chose to attend today's webinar. So how do you see yourself using influencing skills? How do you see yourself using influencing skills? Can you see them coming in, Peggy? <clears throat> I can't. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. It happens. Um, let me summarize. Okay. We, we have a lot of participation today. So <clears throat> I'm seeing a lot of um, improved co collaboration and communication. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple people have said just to get my job done. <laughs> All right. Good. Um, All emo right. Emotional and appeal, um, building trust. Um, I'm seeing motivating, um, motivating my team or motivating um, some even say colleagues or, or my boss. Um, uh, so that's definitely a theme. Um, and productivity, I would say, is is um, you know just kind of getting things in the right direction. Um, okay. And even around um, now, I'm starting to get even some like coaching. Um, okay. All right. Coaching. Definitely coaching. 
Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for uh, for reading those out for me. <laughs> um, and um, you know, and thanks to all of you for you know for giving that question some thought because um, you know there are lots of different ways that we can use influence. There are lots of different ways that we can use influence skills. And, and again, this is one of those things where it's not limited to use at work. Uh, it's, it's a very effective, uh, it's very effective uh, uh, use of uh, applying this to all of our relationships, not only our work relationships, but our relationships again with our friends, with our family, with our kids. Um, there, it's an important aspect of uh, all parts of our life and um, something that I hope you will consider utilizing in different places, not just uh, not just work. So influencing is not about forcing others to accept your point of view. It's not about continuously nagging people until they agree with you. That's nagging. That's not influencing. It's not about bargaining or giving in to someone else's view, even when you believe they're, they're wrong. Um, it's not about giving advice necessarily, although sometimes when we when we do give advice, I think we are trying to influence someone to take a certain path or to approach a problem in a certain way. It's not about having the last word, and it's not about having power over people. It's it's influence. It's it's something different um, than than all those other things I've just described. And influencing is a skill that we know for a fact can be um, used to your advantage when it is used correctly. So let's let's talk a little bit about how you how you influence um oops let me go back one because how you influence helps you and it helps the people um, that you w work with and and it helps your organization and the influence style that a person use uses affects your feelings and and thoughts and also other people's thoughts and feelings uh, towards you which obviously i think plays into helping the total functioning of your organization. So a person who is assertive is more likely to achieve goals and get their voice heard than a person who's not being assertive. And the assertive person will also be able to express himself or herself honestly and openly and directly. And if a person, you know, never expresses their views as in passive behaviors, they're a lot less likely to achieve their own their own goals. They're less likely to have their voice heard. And sometimes it, it's very unfortunate, but sometimes those passive people are the ones who have the best ideas, but they just don't feel confident in in talking about them or in letting other people know what their ideas are. And similarly, you know, people who are aggressive tend to alienate other people. So that's not good. Assertive behavior usually leads to better feelings in both the individual and others. And um, also, I think when we're assertive, when we exercise an assertive influence style, feelings of tensions are, tension are reduced. So, you know, if you're working in a team and a person is assertive, and knows that that they can you know trust you, uh, tensions can be reduced, and trust between people on a team can be developed. And as you behave assertively, the open the open communication that will always occur enhances organizational feedback. It enhances information fl flow because assertive behavior is aimed at maximizing the rights of all parties. It's very respectful. It's a win-win situation. I hear what you have to say and you hear what I have to say. So influence works or impacts in, in a number of, of different ways. So let's, let's talk a little bit before I share with you the, the various influence styles. Let's talk a little bit about the factors that shape our influence style because there are a number a, a number of factors that shape our influence style and you're going to see here that there are two different sides of this diagram one are the individual factors and the other side are the situational factors that impact or, or shape our influence style and i'm going to go over each one of these to show you how they're they're going to impact your influence style because we do learn things at an early age and if you look at your past experience for example you have learned 
what behaviors lead to positive or negative results. And, and this learning that, that occurs at this early age is derived from you know, uh, a number of, of different sources. Um, and the first source is the type of learning that occurs when an individual um, associates um, their, their behavior, their feelings with the behavior without really thinking about it. So we learn through exhibiting a certain behavior. For example, we exhibit aggression and then we feel tense about it. And eventually we're gonna feel that tension before and it will stop us from being aggressive. So our feelings impact the style that we're gonna use. And this is what is known as associative learning. The second, um, the second thing um, is learning uh, by reinforcement. All behaviors yield a consequence. So for example, if you're, um, if you, you see this a lot with children in, in the grocery stores, they have perhaps a very aggressive style of behavior and that aggression gets those kids what they want. So what do they learn? Oh, what, what they're saying to themselves is, okay, if I'm aggressive, if I throw a temper tantrum or shout or you know whatever, I'll get what I want. And on this, on, you know, or some other kid has to be more assertive to get what they want. And other people have learned that being passive will get them what they want. So something is learned through consequences. And the third thing is through modeling. And this requires that the individual will look at people in their own environment, people like their parents and their teachers and their coworkers, and they learn what's acceptable and not acceptable and how they are treated and that's how they will that's how they will they will learn so the third the third way that we learn is through is through modeling the next individual factor are our attitudes and beliefs and when, beliefs and when we look at attitudes <clears throat> and beliefs you know we have to look at beliefs from our culture it's very important attitudes and beliefs about our our fears if for example, if we um, maybe we fear rejection or it could be guilt, another attitude or belief that will impact and affect our in influence style. So we have to make sure that we understand that. And that's the and then the last one is self-confidence on the individual factor. If a person is willing to stand up for his or her rights, they'll have a lot of self-worth and they'll they'll feel very, very comfortable. But other people don't feel like that. Um, it, it depends on on their self. It depends on our inner self confidence. So that is another individual factor that will influence our our um, influence our influence style. And the other um, contributing factors have have to do with how we interact with our in, our environment. Okay, and this is a situation situational factor. And the first one is rewards in your environment. You know your work environment is an environment that will tell you which behaviors you get punished for and which behaviors you get praised for. And these can come in the form of verbal praise or acceptance or increased pay or maybe a better office space. And when you look at assertive behaviors in the workplace, sometimes assertive behaviors are not rewarded. It's better to be passive in organizations. And I hear, I, I hear this in organizations that I consult with and, and some of the employees will say, you know what, I just show up and do what I have to do and I don't voice my opinion and I don't get in trouble. So the organization is actually teaching them in that way what they need, what they need to do. Um, sometimes in organizations, aggressive behaviors are rewarded. This is uh, obviously, I'm not recommending that, it's not good. Um, but, but when aggressive behaviors are rewarded, that gives everybody in that organization an idea of how you're expected to behave. And the second thing is the cost of influence style. Influence style doesn't take, uh, it does take time to learn. It takes our time. It takes our energy. You know, we have to figure out what solutions our words will produce. We have to find out how to phrase those words. So there, there is a cost there. And an individual, if they're going to use an influential style, has to be willing and able to spend the time and the energy um, that it takes to behave assertively. And the last one in, uh, in situation is all the rules and laws that we have in the workplace or society that tell us how to act in a certain way. So those are the factors, and as I said, um, there are many of them, uh, that actually shape our influence style. 
So what exactly what are we talking about though when we're talking about influence? It's, you know, what what's what's the definition uh of of influence? So there are a, a number of of different wor- ways to describe this and I'm I'm going to give you one description of what is influence. But before I even do that, I want to start off with the definition the dictionary defini- definition of influence. And the dictionary definition is it is the capacity of a person to be a compelling force on or produce effects on actions, behaviors, and opinions. So when we when we talk about uh, influence, what we're really talking about is we're really looking at two different dimensions of behavior. The first one is openness, and it's really about openness in communication. And this is my willingness to disclose to another person or to other people my thoughts, my feelings, my past experiences, my reactions. And, you know, some people, and I'm sure you've, you've met people like this, and maybe this describes some of you, some people are very close to the vest, and they don't want to share anything. Okay, they, you you know, they're just, it takes a long time or they have to be extremely comfortable with someone or maybe never are they able to share with with other people. And then other people will be open and share, you know, everything. And some people go overboard in that regard too and and overshare. So it's a continuum from I'm very closed to I'm I'm very open. The next um, piece of influence is consideration. And this is about consideration for other people. And this is an individual's willingness to accord other people the same rights that he or she accords to himself or herself. And again, you're on the spectrum from where some people think, you know, it's my way or the highway, and I'm not going to consider you at all. And then other people are very considerate of everybody in their environment. They don't want to step on anybody's toes or offend anybody. So again, depending on your openness and your consideration, one of four paths or influence style emerges. And and I want you to keep in keep this in mind as we dig deeper into what those four styles are. So the influence model that we're talking about today uh, is one that is, again, it is based on, it has those two dimensions of openness of communication and consideration for for others. So let's talk about each of these um, these four styles, and then we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna look at them even more closely. But the open, the person with openly aggressive um, uh, behavior um, is is the person who is very high in openness, as you can see from this uh, this uh, model, very high in openness, but very low in uh, considerations uh, for for other people. Okay, so openly aggressive people are very high in. Um, very high in openness of communication, but very low in consideration for others. And so what this would uh, look like is that, you know, this is the person who boldly insists that their rights and needs prevail. Okay, that it's just, it's, it's all about me and other, in other, in other words. And then you have the concealed aggressive behavior, somebody who's low in openness of communication and also low in consideration um, for other for other people. So this is the person who would say something like, I suddenly, I subtly, subtly, subtly um, make sure that my rights and needs prevail. Okay, done in a very subtle, in a subtle way, not the same way as the openly aggressive um, uh, person. Assertive behavior are high in, uh, a person with assertive behavior is high in openness of communication and also high in consideration for others. And this person would say something like, I clearly express that we both have rights and we both have needs and I listen and I understand. And then the final one is the passive behavior. And this is someone who's low on openness and high on consideration. So they don't want to step on anybody to, anybody's toes. And again, they would probably some, say something like, um, others' rights and needs take precedence over mine. Okay. So let's continue to look a little bit more specifically um, at these styles. And as I go through them, 
I'm going to be talking about a number of things related to each of these styles. I'm going to be talking about the thoughts that that person, that that style might have, the emotions they might be feeling, what their verbal behavior uh, is going to sound like and how what they're going to express verbally, and then also their non-verbal um, uh, communication or their nonverbal behavior too, and what what might you uh, you know not hear them say but see them saying by other means like body language and facial expressions and those types of things. And there are cultural and situational um, uh, differences that affect our our influence style. And you you know we all know I think that our culture um, that all cultures will respond differently to different behaviors. What may be assertive in one culture could be rude in, in another culture. And even with gender differences, you know, what might be assertive with one group might be looked at as aggressive with another group. So we have to be, we have to be mindful of, of that, the culture of gender as well. And also be mindful of the situation um, that assertive behavior is only possible if I have free choice. And some, you know, quite honestly, some behaviors may be constrained by by the situation. You know, sometimes you just can't go ahead and say anything. You know, sometimes you need to know how to be passive as opposed to being assertive in order to get in order to get what you in order to get what you want. So there very clearly are cultural and situational um, differences. And one thing we know for sure is that there are no absolutes when it comes to um, assertion. Um, no one behaves assertively or non-assertively 100% of the time. I think that a, a, you know, a person who's really good at assertive communication and asserting their needs know, knows when to speak and when not to speak. And sometimes, as we've all learned, maybe the hard way, as I certainly have, you know, sometimes silence is golden. So um, the second thing to keep in mind as we look at these four styles um, is to interpret the terms with care. You know, their tendencies, uh, the, these tendencies and, and behaviors that I'm going to talk about, they're not ironclad categories. And they're not personality types, okay? They're ways of behavior, behaving a certain way to influence another, pe another person. So, so keep that in mind um, as I talk through this, because I'm not trying to, I, I don't, I, I'm not trying to box people in and to say that, you know, you're going to see this 100% of the time or that 100% of the time, because that's, um, that's obviously not what's going to occur. So let's start with um, the openly aggressive style um, first. And as I, as I said before, the descriptive phrase for openly aggressive behavior is, I boldly insist that my rights and need, needs prevail. I boldly insist that my rights and needs prevail. So the thoughts of someone demonstrating this kind of, um, this kind of behavior is um, kind of tends to be hostile, okay? They, the, the openly aggressive person believes that they should have rights. They have a very strong, a very strong need for, for being in control, a extremely difficult time of ever, ever imagining themselves to be wrong. And and as a result of that, will never or rarely admit to be in wrong, and um, a very egocentric. They worry only about themselves and have a very difficult time thinking about anyone else or considering how their behavior is impacting other people. So they're not, you know, honestly, when people are openly aggressive, they're not afraid of of hurting other people. Okay. So the emotions are, are, you know, these are people who are fiery. They're, they're bitter. They're anger. They're angry. Um, you know, and those are the emotion, emotions that are really fueling um, openly aggressive behavior on a, you know, on a fairly regular basis. So what you might hear uh, verbally uh, is a lot of sound, a lot of loud vocal sound. Again, this is someone um, who might fall into the category, quite honestly, of being verbally abusive, um, using insults, you know, thinking that, you know, and that's a way to get to get at people is to just insult them. Um, interrupting other people, you know, is, uh, you know, 
is is normal for the openly aggressive uh, behavior. It's it's considered it's you know it it's considered uh, it's not considered rude um, you know to to open openly um, to interrupt other people. However, other people see openly aggressive behavior as being rude. And non-verbally, you know, again, these are people who try to, with their body language and all of their non-verbals, demonstrate control. Um, so how they stand, how they lean, uh, you know, how they, they glare or using their, you know, using their hands to finger point or to shake fists at other people would be another um, part of their, their uh, non-verbal um, behavior. So, you know, again, not, not, Everyone who is demonstrating openly aggressive behavior is necessarily going to have all of these things, um, but they may have some. And I, I, I'm going to just take a guess um, because this is what usually happens um, as we go through this. Probably some people are already coming to your mind. You know, um, maybe as I was describing that, you were already kind of listing, um, you know, uh, listing. Uh, someone's names or attaching someone's name to that particular style. And um, I, you know, I would be willing to bet that almost all of us at one point in our lives um, have, have maybe had to be openly aggressive, you know, maybe that was us at one point in our lives. Hopefully it's not how we communicate on an ongoing basis and influence people on an ongoing basis. And so the question is, you know, um, do openly aggressive behavior, uh, does openly aggressive behavior get you what you want? And I don't know. I mean, I would say that for people who demonstrate this type of, of um, behavior and influence style a lot, they might think it does. And, and perhaps that's the reinforcement um, that, that keeps, them, keeps them going. There are clearly some costs to this type of behavior. Um, you know, it does, it does offend other people, undoubtedly, um, you know, a lot of people, and, and it creates a lot of resentment. This isn't the person that anyone else wants to work with. Um, it, it's someone that if they're in a group or in a team, they can literally just sort of snuff out everyone's creativity by their openly aggressive behavior. And especially by the way they might talk to other people and the fact that, you know, it is my way or the highway, you know, it's like, this is, this is the only way it can be. Now there's a benefit, you know, um, <laughs> to this type of behavior. It's pretty easy to know what these people are thinking um, you, because they're gonna be right, you know, uh, right out there. They don't, you know, they, they don't hold anything back. Um, so that is a benefit to this particular style, which might not and isn't present in all of the styles. So let's do a quick, uh, a quick little poll here to make sure that you've got the gist of the openly aggressive style. And which statement reflects the openly aggressive style? Is it A, I express my anger through um, various facial expressions, or B, I, um, I believe you must show strength to command respect. Sarah, we should have a couple of more choices on there. Is there another slide? Sarah? Um, you should have C and D. Um, okay, I only, okay, I only see two up on the quick poll right now. Okay, so um, people are responding to C, so I'll go ahead and read those out. Uh, but C should be, okay, go I ahead. don't mind asking for help when I feel I need it. And D um, is I have trouble turning down people's requests. Thank you. Sure. I'm not seeing that on, on the slide that I'm seeing, but I'm glad it's there. <laughs> that's, yeah, no, that's odd. Yeah, and I can see people are answering um, for, for those. So it is getting filled okay. in. Looks like we're still getting a lot of active requests. So let's, um, responses. So let's. Um, Wait another second there. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and share. Mm -hmm. All right, so it looks like um, it, most of you answered B, um, which is I believe you must show strength to command respect. And uh, you are absolutely right. That is the, that is the, the desired answer there. It is B. Um, it, it's not A, but um, you know, they will, people who are openly aggressive will use their facial expressions uh, to exhibit their aggression, 
okay? But it's not A because they're also going to express it verbally as well. And that's why um, B is the one that is, um, that is most reflective of the openly aggressive style. So let's move on and talk about the next style uh, on our model, which is concealed aggressive behavior. And you'll remember that the descriptive um, phrase for concealed aggressive behavior is, I subtly make sure that my rights, um, that my rights and needs prevail. And you know, you might be thinking with this person that everything is fine and dandy, but this is the person who will show you in one way or another that they're actually uh, not really happy about that decision, and um, and they're gonna they're gonna sabotage it in in some in some way. And quite honestly, for me, this is the most difficult style to deal with because these are people who are very manipulative. Okay, but on the surface, they seem like they're agreeable or they're listening, but all of a sudden, you know, you're gonna hear a book slam or, you know, a book be thrown on a desk or a door slam or some other subtle, rude comment. So to me, concealed aggressive behavior is, is a challenge um, because they, you know, they believe, they believe that they have rights and other people don't. Um, very much like the, um, the previous style, they, they assume that they're never wrong and um, they're, they're egocentric and they find subtle ways to get their way. And so they're, you know, the emotions that they're experiencing are things like resentment and some hidden frustration. They're, they're uptight because maybe they can't express themselves um, verbally. And um, so that's, you know, in terms of what they need. And so that's why they might, they might be a little bit uptight. So the verbal behavior of concealed aggressive is that they, they do a lot of what I refer to as, as sniping. You know, they use an indirect expression of insults or threats to other people, not directly, but, in, you know, indirectly. Um, you know, a lot of kind of uh, murmuring and, you know, it's the person who's, you know, sitting off to the side at the meeting and not offering an idea or suggestion, but kind of having a side conver conversation. These are people who have a tendency to gossip and, and to sabotage, a very often sabotaging decisions after they've been made. And, and non-verbally, um, you know, the, they, they, again, just look like they're, um, they're uptight and under a lot of stress, you know, um, forced smile, um, you know, this kind of piercing eye, eye contact, um, a very controlled posture might be something that you will, um, you will see as well. And there are some costs to some real high costs, I think, to this concealed aggressive behavior. Other people will pick it out eventually. And, and then I don't think there's any person who likes to feel manipulated. And um, once we feel that way, we feel as though we've been manipulated by another person, our eagerness and our willingness to work with that individual is greatly diminished. And so these are people that, you know, others just consider untrustworthy. And, you know, in many cases do not want to have a lot to do with them. Um, you know, the style benefit is that it can be, these people can be very clever if you can direct, um, if you can direct them into a positive um, behavior style as opposed to the negative concealed aggressive. So which statement ref reflects the concealed aggressive influence style? I'm afraid to admit that I don't know how to do something I'm expected to do. I am able to express my feelings honestly and directly. I like to be in control of every situation. If I don't agree with my boss, I may find a way to drag my feet quietly on projects he or she wants done. So let's see what you think. Make sure you hit submit. All right, you are very good. You're absolutely right. The correct answer is D. If I don't agree, I may find a way to drag my feet. Um, this concealed aggressive style as someone who has had uh, was a 
a manager all of my career, is in my opinion the most difficult one um, to, uh, to manage, the concealed aggressive style. So let's go on and look at passive behaviors. And the descriptor here is others' rights and needs take precedence over mine. So the passive behavior, their thoughts are very self-negative. Um, they view that others have rights, but they don't think they do necessarily. Um, they tend to be, you know, very hesitant to, to speak up. And, um, you know, uh, you, you might not, you might not see their, their sort of resentment or their built up anger, but when they do, they blow, they'll often just like blow a gasket and it's so out of character and everybody else is like, oh my gosh, what's going on with, you know, that person. Um, and, you know, these are people who are uh, very uh, conflict averse and avoid disagreements and, you know, just afraid to, to do or say anything that, um, that is going to upset any kind of relationship. Both are, uh, you know, work or personal, um, but, you know, they, and, and emotionally, they might feel very victimized or very depressed because they, they wish they could speak up, but they, you know, they never seem to be able to uh, do that. Verbally, um, you know, as you would expect, just sort of a, a meeker voice, uh, use a lot of qualifiers when they're speaking, say things like, what do you think? You know, do you think it's right? What do you think I should do? And, and non-verbally, again, just don't look like they have a lot of self-confidence. So, you know, wringing their hands, um, you know, not not having a very confident posture would be something that we would expect to see in passive behavior. And, and there are some costs to this. Um, you know, this is, again, as I mentioned initially, these are people who often have, you know, great ideas and information, but just don't feel confident enough to express it. And they, you know, they, it's a cost because they, they just don't take responsibility for contributing to the team. And, and that, that's a cost, obviously, to the team and, and ultimately to the organization. The benefit is, you know, they don't create any unnecessary conflict at all. That would not be at all what we would expect to see from the passive behavior side. So, which statement reflects passive influence? When I'm angry with someone, I shut him or her out. If I have something to say that I think is important, I'm going to interrupt a conversation. I feel guilty when I have to ask others to do their shares, share, or I make decisions when I have a reasonable amount of information, even though I might be wrong. So let's go ahead and launch that poll. Tell us quickly what you think about that one. Okay. All right. So you, uh, most of you came up with um, C, which is absolutely the correct answer. Um, I, um, I see as I feel guilty when I have to ask others to, to do their share. Um, you might, a number of you mentioned A too, and, and this is something that I, I think you're probably, you've seen passive people do this, that they just shut people out if they're angry, they don't talk about it. So I would agree with you too, that that's something you might see P, uh, passive, the passive influence style do. Um, but C is the, is the, the most common uh, expression of a passive influence style. So last but not least, of course, we have assertive behavior. And um, the descriptor is, I clearly express that we both have rights and needs. And um, Alberti um, defined assertiveness many long years ago and said that assertiveness um, is a behavior that enables a person to act in his or her best interest, to stand up for herself or himself without anxiety and express feelings honestly and comfortably and exercising their rights without denying the rights of others. But I think he makes some important points about assertive behavior that I think we all need to be aware of. One that is that assertive behavior is a characteristic, assertiveness is a characteristic of the behavior, not the person himself. So it's, it's very um, person and situation specific and it's not universal. As I mentioned to you, no one 
behaves like this 100% of the time. It depends on the situation and it depends on who you're dealing with. Another thing is that assertiveness has to be viewed in cultural and situational context, as I said before, and also a gender context, um, where you are and, and who you're with. And um, in some cases, you know, it, it depends on the uh, whether or not you have the ability to choose freely how you're going to act. And in some cases, you can choose freely, and in other cases, you can't. It really depends on where you are, the organization that you work in, for example, um, and and you know you've got to take all of those things into consideration uh, when you're exercising assertive behavior. So the thoughts of people who are assertive are very self-confident. Um, again, they believe that everyone has rights that should be considered, and you know they objectively try to understand other people and the source of other people's emotion. Um, their emotions tend to be very even-tempered, very patient, um, and again, their, their feelings are directed at behaviors or situations and not at people, and that, that is one of the, the highest indicators, I think, of assertiveness is that, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm directing this at a behavior, um, you know, and especially if I'm in a management position and I'm correcting someone, I'm correcting the behavior. I'm not criticizing the people, the person. I am I am criticizing a certain element of their performance. So that that is a difference in terms of assertive behavior. Um, verbally assertive behavior sounds very clear and very concise. Um, there's a lot of first person language, I language instead of you. It's it's much more uh, you'll hear a lot more I language. People who are assertive are receptive to other people's viewpoints you know they they listen actively and and they're receptive it doesn't mean i agree with you it just means i know that you have a right to state your opinion and i'm going to listen to what that opinion is so non-verbally a, a very confident relaxed posture you know very um open and supportive uh non-verbal behavior a lot of a lot of eye contact a uh, very important part of being assertive is is the use of eye contact now, there are some costs to even being assertive. You know, it takes time and effort to be assertive, and it, and it can be sometimes a challenge to maintain this style in all situations. And you have to take the time to do a situational assessment and figure out, you know, is it right for me to be assertive right now? Uh, is, is this someplace where I can be assertive? But there are incredible benefits, you know, uh, it encourages collaboration and teamwork. It, you know, uh, uh, someone who has assertive behavior is a problem solver and, and not a problem creator. And it really does expedite the, the communication um, process. I know from working with teams and consulting with, with so many teams throughout my career that when the, the large number of people on a, on a team uh, exercise assertive influence, there's an incredible amount of collaboration and teamwork just seem it all flows together and that's when you will see the highest uh the highest level of team performance and and the highest level of um you know really uh return on that performance to to the organization so there's a lot to be said for uh the collaboration and teamwork that comes as a result of assertive influence style so what do you think what statement reflects the assertive influence style is it A, B, C, or D? All right, great job, you guys. You got it. Um, um, it's A. I let people know when I um, when I disagree with you. So people who are, who are assertive, if they don't agree with you, again, they will tell you. But it will be in an open. It will be in an honest, and it will be in a caring way, not a put down kind of a way. And they want you to understand what their feelings are, and they want to hear what your feelings are and what and what your um, opinions are on a particular issue or on something that you've been you've been working on together. 
So here we have, again, um, the, uh, the influence model summary. And um, again, you know, it is based on our openness in communication and our consideration for others. And the continuation, uh, the, uh, not the continuation, the continuum for both of those is high to low or low to high, um, you know, with some, with some behaviors being, um, you know, being very low in both openness and communication and consideration uh, for others and others being more, more mixed. But openly aggressive, concealed aggressive, assertive behavior and, and passive um, behavior. And obviously, you know, um, the, the, the assertive behavior quadrant, um, um, when we talk about how we influence is the one that is going to get the most play and it is going to get the most response and it is going to get the most positive outcomes. So a few things we know um, for about assertive influencers. Um, first of all, people are not born assertive, um, nor does anyone act assertively 100% of the time. Okay. Um, the second thing that we know is that assertiveness results from skills and behaviors that we learn and that we consciously practice over time. The good news is that you can learn to be assertive. You can absolutely learn to be assertive. So it's not something that you were born with or unlike your personality that was kind of hardwired by the time you were seven, you can become assertiveness if you decide that, you know, this is the style that I want to use. This is definitely the style that I want to use to influence people. You can learn how to become assertiveness. So, um, and, and if you practice, if you learn about it and you practice. Um, and the third thing that we know about assertive influencers is that they work towards the win-win. Um, they focus on their communication and they focus on the um, consideration for other people. And in all communication, and certainly in our ability to influence other people, a key ingredient is trust. We need to all work on constantly building and sustaining trust in all of our relationships. And if I don't trust your character and competence, it is highly doubtful that you're going to be able to influence me. And as Edward Murrow once said, to be persuasive, we have to be believable. To be believable, we have to be credible. And to be credible, we have to be truthful. And that, to me, is just what it's all about uh, when, it, when it comes to trust in, in all, of our, all of our relationships. So here are some general suggestions. Um, first of all, use a variety of techniques to in influence other people. Consider what you think their style um, might be. Um, seek assignments that will let you try out, you know, uh, your influence. You know, try to try to seek some assignments where that might be a possibility um, for you if your current job, although it looked like from the opening chat that many of you already have lots of opportunities in your current job. And observe other people who are good influencers and, tr and try to do the things that you see them do. I think this is, to me and for me, has always been one of the most useful things is to observe others who I think have that skill and practice it very, very well. And then finally, we influence others to shape our future or others will shape our futures for us. For us, and I again, to me, this is kind of the compelling, uh, the compelling concluding remark of why our influence style is so important, and why influence is so important to how we are as people, how we are as as parents, as as uh, employees, as uh, people in society. So I hope this has been useful to you, and I'm going to turn this over to Sarah now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peggy, for um, for the insightful <clears throat> for the insightful insightful information. We've had some awesome participation. Um, I do have some questions, so go ahead and um, submit any questions that come come in. Um, but uh, the 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 one thing that I just I wanted to I know that has kind of come up. Um, Peggy, that I just thought before we closed, um, you might be able to just kind of conceal about is is some people put um put out there um just some kind of basic terms for each of the four styles and so someone had said the openly aggressive is is kind of your classic bully the concealed aggressive might be um that quiet nod that just says like nice job um mm -hmm. and so 
um, people were putting out some of those kind of phrases. And I thought um, that it that it might be helpful if if you could um, just kind of share a little bit about each of those four that might just give people that quick little clue. Are they on the right job that it is that simple to um, to kind of see see that behavior? Um, or is there something kind of more complicated to it or are, are people's kind of guts sort of spot on? <laughs> Well, I, I would agree with you, and I, I, I'm sure as I was going through the, the, the descriptions of these four, you were probably, you know, you were probably naming um, those. And if that's something that, you know, helps people to uh, remember or to identify, I don't think there's anything, there's anything wrong with, uh, with, with doing that. Um, my only caution to you would be that um, when we label things a certain way, especially something like bully or, um, you know, uh, you know, milk toast, or you know, for the for the passive. For if, when we when we assign uh, negative labels to things, um, then I think that perhaps the ability to really have people honestly self-identify and recognize is this a style that's working for me. And if not, what do I need to do differently? I mean, openly aggressive and and concealed aggressive aren't particularly uh, pleasant things to say about yourself. But if you can acknowledge that that is how I influence, and honestly, I'm not a very good influencer, so I need to work on that, then if it leads, if having, if having any kind of a label then leads us to doing something that's different and better and more effective, then I say, you know, go for it. Um, I don't think there, the, you know, this model doesn't have those kinds of labels, obviously, um, or those kind of one word, uh, one word uh, descriptors, but um, you could, you could probably easily do that. Yeah, good, good. Thank you so much. Um, and, and Katie here on our line participating today has transitioned um, us, um, transitioned me perfectly to answer her question here. She has asked, um, how do we know which style we fit into? And um, the model that, that Peggy has gone, taken us through today of those four styles is a, is a self-assessment. It's published by HRDQ, um, years of research and development around those. Um, so it's a well-researched self-assessment. And it also comes with a workshop. So a lot of what Peggy addressed today on kind of how do you identify those styles um, within yourself and then how do you make that shift to the assertive style um, is part of the facilitator guide um, workshop. So if you are looking to either learn for yourself um, what your influence style is, you can take the online self-assessment um, of the interpersonal influence inventory. If you're looking to train that content in your organization, you have two ways. You can purchase the facilitator set um, for 25% off with the coupon you see here. Um, good through January 17th. So you can check that out. That'll give you everything you need to deliver a program. Um, the other thing you can do is reach out to HRDQ. We also have expert trainers like Peggy um, that we can send on site to your organization and they can deliver this training. So sometimes um, for this topic in particular, that actually can be helpful to have an outside expert um, deliver that. So consider HRDQ for some of your service training as well. Well, that's all the time we had today. Peggy, thank you so much. Um, great talk today. And uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Happy holidays, everyone.